The History of the Telephone by Herbert Casson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by J. Randolph. Chapter 2 The Building of the Business. After the telephone had been born in Boston, baptized in the patent office, and given a royal reception at the Philadelphia Centennial, it might be supposed that its life thenceforth would be one of peace and pleasantness. But as this is history, and not fancy, there must be set down the very surprising fact that the young newcomer received no welcome and no notice from the great business world. It is a scientific toy, said the men of trade and commerce. It is an interesting instrument, of course, for professors of electricity and acoustics, but it can never be a practical necessity. As well might you propose to put a telescope into a steel mill, or to hitch a balloon to a shoe factory. Poor Bell, instead of being applauded, was pelted with a hailstorm of ridicule. He was an impostor, a ventriloquist, a crank who says he can talk through a wire. The London Times alluded pompously to the telephone as the latest American humbug, and gave many profound reasons why speech could not be sent over a wire because of the intermittent nature of the electric current. Almost all electricians, the men who were supposed to know, pronounced the telephone an impossible thing, and those who did not openly declare it to be a hoax believed that Bell had stumbled upon some freakish use of electricity which could never be of any practical value. Even though he came late in the succession of inventors, Bell had to run the gauntlet of scoffing and adversity. By the reception that the public gave to his telephone, he learned to sympathize with Howe, whose first sewing machine was smashed by a Boston mob, with McCormick, whose first reaper was called a cross between an Astley chariot, a wheelbarrow, and a flying machine, with Morse, whom ten congresses regarded as a nuisance, with Cyrus Field, whose Atlantic cable was denounced as a mad freak of stubborn ignorance, and with Westinghouse, who was called a fool for proposing to stop a railroad train with wind. The very idea of talking at a piece of sheet iron was so new and extraordinary that the normal mind repulsed it. Alike to the laborer and the scientist, it was incomprehensible. It was too freakish, too bizarre, to be used outside of the laboratory and the museum. No one, literally, could understand how it worked and the only man who offered a clear solution of the mystery was a Boston mechanic, who maintained that there was a hole through the middle of the wire. People who talked for the first time into a telephone box had a sort of stage fright. They felt foolish. To do so seemed an absurd performance, especially when they had to shout at the top of their voices. Plainly, whatever of convenience there might be in this new contrivance— was far outweighed by the loss of potential dignity, and very few men had sufficient imagination to picture the telephone as a part of the machinery of their daily work. The banker said it might do well enough for grocers, but that it would never be of any value to banking. And the grocer said it might do well enough for bankers, but it would never be of any value to grocers. As Bell had worked out his invention in Salem, one editor displayed the headline, Salem Witchcraft. The New York Herald said, The effect is weird and almost supernatural. The Providence Press said, It is hard to resist the notion that the powers of darkness are somehow in league with it. And the Boston Times said, in an editorial of bantering ridicule, A fellow can now court his girl in China as well as in East Boston. But the most serious aspect of this invention is the awful and irresponsible power it will give to the average mother-in-law who will be able to send her voice around the habitable globe. 
There were hundreds of shrewd capitalists in American cities in 1876, looking with sharp eyes in all directions for business chances. But not one of them came to Bell with an offer to buy his patent. No one came running for a state contract. And neither did any legislature or city council come forward to the task of giving the people a cheap and efficient telephone service. As for Bell himself, he was not a man of affairs. In all practical business matters, he was as incompetent as a Byron or a Shelley. He had done his part, and it now remained for men of different abilities to take up his telephone and adapt it to the uses and conditions of the business world. The first man to undertake this work was Gardiner G. Hubbard, who became soon afterwards the father-in-law of Bell. He, too, was a man of enthusiasm rather than of efficiency. He was not a man of wealth or business experience, but he was admirably suited to introduce the telephone to a hostile public. His father had been a judge of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, and he himself was a lawyer whose practice had been mainly in matters of legislation. He was, in 1876, a man of venerable appearance, with white hair worn long and a patriarchal beard. He was a familiar figure in Washington, and well known among the public men of his day. A versatile and entertaining companion, by turns prosperous and impecunious, and an optimist always, Gardner Hubbard became a really indispensable factor as the first advance agent of the telephone business. No other citizen had done more for the city of Cambridge than Hubbard. It was he who secured gas for Cambridge in 1858 and pure water and a street railway to Boston. He had gone through the South in 1860 in the patriotic hope that he might avert the impending civil war. He had induced the legislature to establish the first public school for deaf mutes, the school that drew Bell to Boston in 1871. And he had been for years a most restless agitator for improvements in telegraphy and the post office. So, as a promoter of schemes for the public good, Hubbard was by no means a novice. His first step toward capturing the attention of an indifferent nation was to beat the big drum of publicity. He saw that this new idea of telephoning must be made familiar to the public mind. He talked telephone by day and by night. Whenever he traveled, he carried a pair of the magical instruments in his valise and gave demonstrations on trains and in hotels. He buttonholed every influential man who crossed his path. He was a veritable ancient mariner of the telephone. No possible listener was allowed to escape. Further to promote this campaign of publicity, Hubbard encouraged Bell and Watson to perform a series of sensational feats with the telephone. A telegraph wire between New York and Boston was borrowed for half an hour, and in the presence of Sir William Thompson, Bell sent a tune over the 250-mile line. "'Can you hear?' he asked the operator at the New York end. "'Elegantly,' responded the operator. "'What tune?' Bell asked. "'Yankee Doodle,' came the answer. Shortly afterwards, while Bell was visiting at his father's house in Canada, he bought up all the stovepipe wire in town and tacked it to a rail fence between the house and a telegraph office. Then he went to a village eight miles distant and sent scraps of songs and Shakespearean quotations over the wire. There was still a large percentage of people who denied that spoken words could be transmitted by a wire. When Watson talked to Bell at public demonstrations, there were newspaper editors who referred skeptically to the supposititious Watson. So, to silence these doubters, Bell and Watson planned a most severe test of the telephone. They borrowed the telegraph line between Boston and the Cambridge Observatory and attached a telephone to each end. Then they maintained, for three hours or longer, the first sustained conversation by telephone, each one taking careful notes of what he said and of what he heard. These notes were published in parallel columns in The Boston Advertiser, October 19, 1876, and proved beyond question that the telephone was now a practical success. <laughs> 
After this, one event crowded quickly on the heels of another. A series of ten lectures was arranged for Bell, at a hundred dollars a lecture, which was the first money payment he had received for his invention. His opening night was in Salem, before an audience of five hundred people, and with Mrs. Sanders, the motherly old lady who had sheltered Bell in the days of his experiment, sitting proudly in one of the front seats. A pole was set up at the front of the hall, supporting the end of a telegraph wire that ran from Salem to Boston. And Watson, who became the first public talker by telephone, sent messages from Boston to various members of the audience. An account of this lecture was sent by telephone to the Boston Globe, which announced the next morning, This special dispatch of the Globe has been transmitted by telephone in the presence of twenty people, who have thus been witnesses to a feat never before attempted, the sending of news over the space of sixteen miles by the human voice. This Globe dispatch awoke the newspaper editors with an unexpected jolt. For the first time they began to notice that there was a new word in the language, and a new idea in the scientific world. No newspaper had made any mention whatever of the telephone for seventy-five days after Bell received his patent. Not one of the swarm of reporters who thronged the Philadelphia Centennial had regarded the telephone as a matter of any public interest. But when a column of news was sent by telephone to the Boston Globe, the whole newspaper world was agog with excitement. A thousand pens wrote the name of Bell. Requests to repeat his lecture came to Bell from Cyrus W. Field, the veteran of the Atlantic Cable, from the poet Longfellow, and from many others. As he was by profession an elocutionist, Bell was able to make the most of these opportunities. His lectures became popular entertainments. They were given in the largest halls. At one lecture, two Japanese gentlemen were induced to talk to one another in their own language via the telephone. At a second lecture, a band played the Star-Spangled Banner in Boston and was heard by an audience of 2,000 people in Providence. At a third, Signor Ferrante, who was in Providence, sang a selection from The Marriage of Figaro to an audience in Boston. At a fourth, an exhortation from Moody and a song from Sankey came over the vibrating wire. And at a fifth, in New Haven... Bell stood sixteen Yale professors in line, hand in hand, and talked through their bodies, a feat which was then, and is today, almost too wonderful to believe. Very slowly these lectures and the tireless activity of Hubbard pushed back the ridicule and the incredulity, and in the merry month of May, 1877, a man named Emery drifted into Hubbard's office from the nearby city of Charlestown, and leased two telephones for twenty actual dollars, the first money ever paid for a telephone. This was the first feeble sign that such a novelty as the telephone business could be established, and no money ever looked handsomer than this twenty dollars did to Bell, Sanders, Hubbard, and Watson. It was the tiny first fruit of fortune. Greatly encouraged, they prepared a little circular which was the first advertisement of the telephone business. It is an oddly simple little document today, but to the 1877 brain, it was startling. It modestly claimed that a telephone was superior to a telegraph for three reasons. One, no skilled operator is required, but direct communication may be had by speech without the intervention of a third person. Two, the communication is much more rapid, the average number of words transmitted in a minute by the Morse sounder being from 15 to 20, by telephone from 1 to 200. 3. No expense is required, either for its operation or repair. It needs no battery, and has no complicated machinery. It is unsurpassed for economy and simplicity. The only telephone line in the world at this time was between the Williams Workshop in Boston and the home of Mr. Williams in Somerville. But in May 1877, a young man named E.T. Holmes, who was running a burglar alarm business in Boston, proposed that a few telephones be linked to his wires. He was a friend and customer of Williams, 
and suggested this plan half in jest and half in earnest. Hubbard was quick to seize this opportunity and at once lent Holmes a dozen telephones. Without asking permission, Holmes went into six banks and nailed up a telephone in each. Five bankers made no protest, but the sixth indignantly ordered that playtoy to be taken out. The other five telephones could be connected by a switch in Holmes' office, and thus was born the first tiny and crude telephone exchange. Here it ran for several weeks as a telephone system by day and a burglar alarm by night. No money was paid by the bankers. The service was given to them as an exhibition and an advertisement. The little shelf with its five telephones was no more like the marvelous exchanges of today than a canoe is like a cunarder, but it was unquestionably the first place where several telephone wires came together and could be united. Soon afterwards, Holmes took his telephones out of the banks and started a real telephone business among the express companies of Boston. But by this time, several exchanges had been opened for ordinary business in New Haven, Bridgeport, New York, and Philadelphia. Also, a man from Michigan had arrived with the hardihood to ask for a state agency, George W. Balch of Detroit. He was so welcome that Hubbard joyfully gave him everything he asked, a perpetual right to the whole state of Michigan. Balch was not required to pay a cent in advance except his railway fare, and before he was many years older he had sold his lease for a handsome fortune of a quarter of a million dollars, honestly earned by his initiative and enterprise. By August, when Bell's patent was sixteen months old, there were 778 telephones in use. This looked like success to the optimistic Hubbard, he decided that the time had come to organize the business, so he created a simple agreement which he called the Bell Telephone Association. This agreement gave Bell, Hubbard, and Sanders a three-tenths interest apiece in the patents, and Watson one-tenth. There was no capital. There was none to be had. The four men had at this time an absolute monopoly of the telephone business, and everybody else was quite willing that they should have it. The only man who had money and dared to stake it on the fortune of the telephone was Thomas Sanders, and he did this not mainly for business reasons. Both he and Hubbard were attached to Bell primarily by sentiment, as Bell had removed the blight of dumbness from Sanders' little son, and was soon to marry Hubbard's daughter. Also, Sanders had no expectation, at first, that so much money would be needed. He was not rich. His entire business, which was that of cutting out soles for shoe manufacturers, was not at any time worth more than $35,000. Yet from 1874 to 1878, he had advanced nine-tenths of the money that was spent on the telephone. He had paid Bell's room rent, and Watson's wages, and William's expenses, and the cost of the exhibit at the Centennial. The first 5,000 telephones, and more, were made with his money, and so many long, expensive months dragged by before any relief came to Sanders that he was compelled, much against his will and his business judgment, to stretch his credit within an inch of the breaking point to help Bell and the telephone. Desperately, he signed note after note until he faced a total of $110,000. If the new scientific toy succeeded, which he often doubted, he would be the richest citizen in Haverhill, and if it failed, which he sorely feared, he would be a bankrupt. A disheartening series of rebuffs slowly forced the truth in upon Sanders' mind that the business world refused to accept the telephone as an article of commerce. It was a toy, a plaything, a scientific wonder, but not a necessity to be bought and used for ordinary purposes by ordinary people. Capitalists treated it exactly as they had treated the Atlantic Cable Project when Cyrus Field visited Boston in 1862. They admired and marveled, but not a man subscribed a dollar. Also, Sanders very soon learned that it was a most unpropitious time for the setting afloat of a new enterprise— 
It was a period of turmoil and suspicion. What with the J. Cook failure, the Hayes-Tilden deadlock, and the bursting of a hundred railroad bubbles, there was very little in the news of the day to encourage investors. It was impossible for Sanders, or Bell, or Hubbard to prepare any definite plan. No matter what the plan might have been, they had no money to put it through. They believed that they had something new and marvelous, which someone, somewhere, would be willing to buy. Until this good genie should arrive, they could do no more than flounder ahead and take whatever business was the nearest and the cheapest. So, while Bell, in eloquent rhapsodies, painted word pictures of a universal telephone service to applauding audiences, Sanders and Hubbard were leasing telephones two by two to businessmen who previously had been using the private lines of the Western Union Telegraph Company. This great corporation was at the time their natural and inevitable enemy. It had swallowed most of its competitors and was reaching out to monopolize all methods of communication by wire. The rosiest hope that shone in front of Sanders and Hubbard was that the Western Union might conclude to buy the Bell patents, just as it had already bought many others. In one moment of discouragement, they had offered the telephone to President Orton of the Western Union for $100,000, and Orton had refused it. What use, he asked pleasantly, could this company make of an electrical toy? But besides the operation of its own wires, the Western Union was supplying customers with various kinds of printing telegraphs and dial telegraphs, some of which could transmit 60 words a minute. These accurate instruments, it believed, could never be displaced by such a scientific oddity as the telephone. And it continued to believe this until one of its subsidiary companies, the Golden Stock, reported that several of its machines had been superseded by telephones. At once the Western Union awoke from its indifference. Even this tiny nibbling at its business must be stopped. It took action quickly and organized the American Speaking Telephone Company with $300,000 capital and with three electrical inventors, Edison, Gray, and Dolbear, on its staff. With all of the bulk of its great wealth and prestige, it swept down upon Bell and its little bodyguard. It trampled upon Bell's patent with as little concern as an elephant can have when he tramples upon an ant's nest. To the complete bewilderment of Bell, it coolly announced that it had the only original telephone, and that it was ready to supply superior telephones with all the latest improvements made by the original inventors, Dolbear, Gray, and Edison. The result was strange and unexpected. The Bell Group, instead of being driven from the field, were at once lifted to a higher level in the business world. The effect was as if the Standard Oil Company were to commence the manufacture of aeroplanes. In a flash, the telephone ceased to be a scientific toy and became an article of commerce. It began for the first time to be taken seriously, and the Western Union, in the endeavor to protect its private lines, became involuntarily a bellwether to lead capitalists in the direction of the telephone. Sanders' relatives, who were many and rich, came to his rescue. Most of them were well-known businessmen, the Bradleys, the Saltonstalls, Fay, Silsby, and Carlton. These men, together with Colonel William H. Forbes, who came in as a friend of the Bradleys, were the first capitalists who, for purely business reasons, invested money in the Bell Patents. Two months after the Western Union had given its weighty endorsement to the telephone, these men organized a company to do business in New England only and put $50,000 in its treasury. In a short time, the delighted Hubbard found himself leasing telephones at the rate of a thousand a month. He was no longer a promoter, but a general manager. Men were standing in line to ask for agencies. Crude little telephone exchanges were being started in a dozen or more cities. There was a spirit of confidence and enterprise, and the next step, clearly, was to create a business organization. None of the partners were competent to undertake such a work. Hubbard had little aptitude as an organizer. Bell had none. 
and Sanders was held fast by his leather interests. Here at last, after four years of the most heroic effort, were the raw materials out of which a telephone business could be constructed. But who was to be the builder, and where was he to be found? One morning the indefatigable Hubbard solved the problem. Watson, he said, there's a young man in Washington who can handle this situation, and I want you to run down and see what you think of him. Watson went, reported favorably, and in a day or so the young man received a letter from Hubbard offering him the position of general manager at a salary of $3,500 a year. We rely, Hubbard said, upon your executive ability, your fidelity, and your unremitting zeal. The young man replied, in one of those dignified letters more usual in the 19th than in the 20th century, My faith in the success of the enterprise is such that I am willing to trust to it, he wrote, and I have confidence that we shall establish the harmony and cooperation that is essential to the success of an enterprise of this kind. One week later, the young man, Theodore N. Vale, took his seat as general manager in a tiny office in Reed Street, New York, and the building of the business began. This arrival of Vale at the critical moment emphasized the fact that Bell was one of the most fortunate of inventors. He was not robbed of his invention, as might easily have happened. One by one there arrived to help him a number of able men, with all the various abilities that the changing situation required. There was such a focusing of factors that the whole matter appeared to have been previously rehearsed. No sooner had Bell appeared on the stage than his supporting players, each in his turn, received his cue and took part in the action of the drama. There was not one of these men who could have done the work of any other. Each was distinctive and indispensable. Bell invented the telephone, Watson constructed it, Sanders financed it, Hubbard introduced it, and Vale put it on a business basis. The new general manager had, of course, no experience in the telephone business. Neither had anyone else. But he, like Bell, came to his task with a most surprising fitness. He was a member of the historic Vale family of Morristown, New Jersey, which had operated the Speedwell Iron Works for four or five generations. His granduncle Stephen had built the engines for the Savannah, the first American steamship to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and his cousin Alfred was the friend and co-worker of Morse, the inventor of the telegraph. Morse had lived for several years at the Vale Homestead in Morristown, and it was here that he erected his first telegraph line, a three-mile circle around the ironworks, in 1888. He and Alfred Vail experimented side by side in the making of the telegraph, and Vail eventually received a fortune for his share of the Morse patent. Thus it happened that young Theodore Vail learned the dramatic story of Morse at his mother's knee. As a boy, he played around the first telegraph line and learned to put messages on the wire. His favorite toy was a little telegraph that he had constructed for himself. At twenty-two, he went west in the vague hope of possessing a bonanza farm. Then he swung back into telegraphy, and in a few years found himself in the government mail service at Washington. By 1876, he was head of this department, which he completely reorganized. He introduced the bag system in postal cars, and made war on waste and clumsiness. By virtue of this position, he was the one man in the United States who had a comprehensive view of all railways and telegraphs. He was much more apt, consequently, than other men to develop the idea of a national telephone system. While in the midst of this bureaucratic house-cleaning, he met Hubbard, who had just been appointed by President Hayes as the head of a commission on mail transportation. He and Hubbard were constantly thrown together, on trains and in hotels, and as Hubbard invariably had a pair of telephones in his valise, the two men soon became co-enthusiasts. Vale found himself painting brain pictures of the future telephone, and by the time he was asked to become its general manager, he had become so confident that, as he said afterwards, he was willing to leave a government job with a small salary for a telephone job with no salary.' 
So, just as Amos Kendall had left the post office service thirty years before to establish the telegraph business, Theodore N. Vail left the post office service to establish the telephone business. He had been in authority over 3,500 postal employees and was the developer of a system that covered every inhabited portion of the country. Consequently, he had a quality of experience that was immensely valuable in straightening out the tangled affairs of the telephone. Line by line, he mapped out a method, a policy, a system. He introduced a larger view of the telephone business and swept off the table all schemes for selling out. He persuaded half a dozen of his post office friends to buy stock, so that in less than two months the first Bell Telephone Company was organized, with $450,000 capital and a service of 12,000 telephones. Vale's first step, naturally, was to stiffen up the backbone of this little company and to prevent the Western Union from frightening it into a surrender. He immediately sent a copy of Bell's patent to every agent, with orders to hold the fort against all opposition. "'We have the only original telephone patents,' he wrote. "'We have organized and introduced the business, and we do not propose to have it taken from us by any corporation.' To one agent, who was showing the white feather, he wrote, "'You have too great an idea of the Western Union.' If it was all massed in your one city, you might well fear it. But it is represented there by one man only, and he probably has as much as he can attend to outside of the telephone. For you to acknowledge that you cannot compete with his influence when you make it your special business is hardly the thing. There may be a dozen concerns that will all go to the Western Union, but they will not take with them all their friends. I would advise that you go ahead and keep your present advantage. We must organize companies with sufficient vitality to carry on a fight, as it is simply useless to get a company started that will succumb to the first bit of opposition it may encounter. Next, having encouraged his thoroughly alarmed agents, Vale proceeded to build up a definite business policy. He stiffened up the contracts and made them good for five years only. He confined each agent to one place— and reserved all rights to connect one city with another. He established a department to collect and protect any new inventions that concerned the telephone. He agreed to take part of the royalties in stock when any local company preferred to pay its debts in this way. And he took steps toward standardizing all telephonic apparatus by controlling the factories that made it. These various measures were part of Vale's plan to create a national telephone system. His central idea, from the first, was not the mere leasing of telephones, but rather the creation of a federal company that would be a permanent partner in the entire telephone business. Even in that day of small things, and amidst the confusion and rough and tumble of pioneering, he worked out the broad policy that prevails today. And this goes far to explain the fact that there are in the United States twice as many telephones as there are in all other countries combined. Vale arrived very much as Blucher did at the Battle of Waterloo, a trifle late, but in time to prevent the telephone forces from being routed by the old guard of the Western Union. He was scarcely seated in his managerial chair when the Western Union threw the entire Bell Army into confusion by launching the Edison transmitter. Edison, who was at that time fairly started in his career of wizardry, had made an instrument of marvelous alertness. It was beyond all argument superior to the telephones then in use, and the lessees of Bell Telephones clamored with one voice for, A transmitter as good as Edison's. This, of course, could not be had in a moment, and the five months that followed were the darkest days in the childhood of the telephone. How to compete with the Western Union, which had this superior transmitter, a host of agents, a network of wires, forty millions of capital— and a first claim upon all newspapers, hotels, railroads, and rights-of-way? That was the immediate problem that confronted the new general manager. Every inch of progress had to be fought for. Several of his captains deserted, and he was compelled to take control of their unprofitable exchanges. There was scarcely a mail that did not bring him some bulletin of discouragement or defeat.' 
In the effort to conciliate a hostile public, the telephone rates had everywhere been made too low. Hubbard had set a price of $20 a year for the use of two telephones on a private line, and when exchanges were started, the rate was seldom more than $3 a month. There were deadheads in abundance, mostly officials and politicians. In St. Louis, one of the few cities that charged a sufficient price, nine-tenths of the merchants refused to become subscribers. In Boston, the first pay station ran three months before it earned a dollar. Even as late as 1880, when the first National Telephone Convention was held at Niagara Falls, one of the delegates expressed the general situation very correctly when he said, We were all in a state of enthusiastic uncertainty. We were full of hope, yet when we analyzed those hopes, they were very airy indeed. There was probably not one company that could say it was making a cent, nor even that it was expected to make a cent. Especially in the largest cities, where the Western Union had most power, the lives of the telephone pioneers were packed with hardships and adventures. In Philadelphia, for instance, a resolute young man named Thomas E. Cornish was attacked as though he had suddenly become a public enemy when he set out to establish the first telephone service. No official would grant him a permit to string wires. His workmen were arrested. The printing telegraph men warned him that he must either quit or be driven out. When he asked capitalists for money, they replied he might as well expect to lease Jews' harps as telephones. Finally, he was compelled to resort to strategy where argument had failed. He had received an order from Colonel Thomas Scott, who wanted a wire between his house and his office. Colonel Scott was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and therefore a man of the highest prestige in the city. So as soon as Cornish had put this line in place, he kept his men at work stringing other lines. When the police interfered, he showed them Colonel Scott's signature and was let alone. In this way, he put fifteen wires up before the trick was discovered, and soon afterwards, with eight subscribers, he founded the first Philadelphia Exchange. As may be imagined, such battling as this did not put much money into the treasury of the parent company, and the letters written by Sanders at this time prove that it was in a hard plight. The following was one of the queries put to Hubbard by the overburdened Sanders. How on earth do you expect me to meet a draft of $275 without a dollar in the treasury and with a debt of $30,000 staring us in the face? Vale's salary is small enough, he continued in a second letter, but as to where it is coming from, I am not so clear. Bradley is awfully blue and discouraged. Williams is tormenting me for money and my personal credit will not stand everything. I have advanced the company $2,000 today, and Williams must have $3,000 more this month. His payday has come, and his capital will not carry him another inch. If Bradley throws up his hand, I will unfold to you my last desperate plan. And if the company had little money, it had less credit. Once when Vale had ordered a small bill of goods from a merchant named Tillotson of 15 Day Street, New York, the merchant replied that the goods were ready, and so was the bill, which was seven dollars. By a strange coincidence, the magnificent building of the New York Telephone Company stands today on the site of Tillotson's store. Month after month, the little bell company lived from hand to mouth. No salaries were paid in full. Often, for weeks, they were not paid at all. In Watson's notebook, there are such entries during this period as Lent Bell 50 Cents lent Hubbard twenty cents, bought one bottle beer, too bad can't have beer every day. More than once Hubbard would have gone hungry had not Devonshire, the only clerk, shared with him the contents of a dinner pail. Each one of the little group was beset by taunts and temptations. Watson was offered ten thousand dollars for his one-tenth interest and hesitated three days before refusing it. Railroad companies offered Vale a salary that was higher and sure if he would superintend their mail business. And as for Sanders, his folly was the talk of Haverhill. One Haverhill capitalist, E.J.M. Hale, stopped him on the street and asked, "'Haven't you got a good leather business, Mr. Sanders?' "'Yes,' replied Sanders. "'Well,' said Hale, "'you had better attend to it and quit playing on wind instruments.' Sanders' banker, too, became uneasy on one occasion and requested him to call at the bank. 
Mr. Sanders, he said, I will be obliged if you will take that telephone stock out of the bank and give me in its place your note for thirty thousand dollars. I am expecting the examiner here in a few days, and I don't want to get caught with that stuff in the bank. Then, in the very midnight of this depression, poor Bell returned from England, whither he and his bride had gone on their honeymoon, and announced that he had no money that he had failed to establish a telephone business in England, and that he must have a thousand dollars at once to pay his urgent debts. He was thoroughly discouraged and sick. As he lay in the Massachusetts General Hospital, he wrote a cry for help to the embattled little company that was making its desperate fight to protect his patents. Thousands of telephones are now in operation in all parts of the country, he said, yet I have not received one cent from my invention. On the contrary, I am largely out of pocket by my researches, as the mere value of the profession that I have sacrificed during my three years' work amounts to twelve thousand dollars. Fortunately, there came, in almost the same mail with Bell's letter, another letter from a young Bostonian named Francis Blake, with the good news that he had invented a transmitter as satisfactory as Edison's, and that he would prefer to sell it for stock instead of cash. If ever a man came as an angel of light, that man was Francis Blake. The possession of his transmitter instantly put the Bell Company on an even footing with the Western Union in the matter of apparatus. It encouraged the few capitalists who had invested money, and it stirred others to come forward. The general business situation had by this time become more settled, and in four months the company had 22,000 telephones in use, and had reorganized into the National Bell Telephone Company, with $850,000 capital, and with Colonel Forbes as its first president. Forbes now picked up the load that had been carried so long by Sanders. As the son of an East India merchant and the son-in-law of Ralph Waldo Emerson, he was a Bostonian of the Brahmin caste. He was a big four-square man who was both popular and efficient, and his leadership at this crisis was of immense value. This reorganization put the telephone business into the hands of competent businessmen at every point. It brought the heroic and experimental period to an end. From this time onwards, the telephone had strong friends in the financial world. It was being attacked by the Western Union and by rival inventors who were jealous of Bell's achievement. It was being half-starved by cheap rates and crippled by clumsy apparatus. It was being abused and grumbled at by an impatient public. But the art of making and marketing it had at last been built up into a commercial enterprise. It was now a business fighting for its life. End of Chapter 2 of The History of the Telephone by Herbert Casson. The History of the Telephone by Herbert Casson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by J. Randolph Chapter 3. The Holding of the Business For seventeen months no one disputed Bell's claim to be the original inventor of the telephone. All the honor, such as it was, had been given to him freely, and no one came forward to say that it was not rightfully his. No one, so far as we know, had any strong desire to do so. No one conceived that the telephone would ever be any more than a whimsical oddity of science. It was so new, so unexpected, that from Lord Kelvin down to the messenger boys in the telegraph offices, it was an incomprehensible surprise. But after Bell had explained his invention in public lectures before more than 20,000 people, after it had been on exhibition for months at the Philadelphia Centennial, after several hundred articles on it had appeared in newspapers and scientific magazines, and after actual sales of telephones had been made in various parts of the country, there began to appear such a succession of claimants and infringers that the forgetful public came to believe that the telephone, like most inventions, 
was the product of many minds. Just as Morse, who was the sole inventor of the American Telegraph in 1837, was confronted by 62 rivals in 1838, so Bell, who was the sole inventor in 1876, found himself two years later almost mobbed by the tick-borne claimants of the telephone. The inventors who had been his competitors in the attempt to produce a musical telegraph persuaded themselves that they had unconsciously done as much as he. Any possessor of a telegraphic patent, who had used the common phrase, talking wire, had a chance to build up a plausible story of prior invention. And others came forward with claims so vague and elusive that Bell would scarcely have been more surprised if the heirs of Goethe had demanded a share of the telephone royalties on the ground that Faust had spoken of making a bridge through the moving air. This babel of inventors and pretenders amazed Bell and disconcerted his backers, but it was no more than might have been expected. Here was a patent, the most valuable single patent ever issued, and yet the invention itself was so simple that it could be duplicated easily by any smart boy or any ordinary mechanic. The making of a telephone was like the trick of Columbus standing an egg on end. Nothing was easier to those who knew how. And so it happened that, as the crude little model of Bell's original telephone lay in the patent office, open and unprotected except by a few phrases that clever lawyers might evade, there sprang up inevitably around it the most costly and persistent patent war that any country has ever known, continuing for eleven years and comprising six hundred lawsuits. The first attack upon the young telephone business was made by the Western Union Telegraph Company. It came charging full tilt upon Bell, driving three inventors abreast, Edison, Gray, and Dolbear. It expected an easy victory. In fact, the disparity between the two opponents was so evident that there seemed little chance of a contest of any kind. The Western Union will swallow up the telephone people, said public opinion, just as it has already swallowed up all improvements in telegraphy. At that time, it should be remembered, the Western Union was the only corporation that was national in its extent. It was the most powerful electrical company in the world, and as Bell wrote to his parents, probably the largest corporation that ever existed. It had behind it not only forty millions of capital, but the prestige of the Vanderbilts, and the favor of financiers everywhere. Also it met the telephone pioneers at every point because it, too, was a wire company. It owned rights-of-way along roads and on housetops. It had a monopoly of hotels and railroad offices. No matter in what direction the Bell Company turned, the live wire of the Western Union lay across its path. From the first, the Western Union relied more upon its strength than upon the merits of its case. Its chief electrical expert, Frank L. Pope, had made a six-month examination of the Bell patents. He had bought every book in the United States and Europe that was likely to have any reference to the transmission of speech, and employed a professor who knew eight languages to translate them. He and his men ransacked libraries and patent offices. They rummaged and sleuthed and interviewed and found nothing of any value. In his final report to the Western Union, Mr. Pope announced that there was no way to make a telephone except Bell's way and advised the purchase of the Bell patents. I am entirely unable to discover any apparatus or method anticipating the invention of Bell as a whole, he said, and I conclude that his patent is valid but the officials of the great corporation refused to take this report seriously. They threw it aside and employed Edison, Gray, and Dolbear to devise a telephone that could be put into competition with Bell's. As we have seen in the previous chapter, there now came a period of violent competition, which is remembered as the dark ages of the telephone business. The Western Union bought out several of the Bell exchanges and opened up a lively war on the others. As befitting its size, it claimed everything. It introduced Gray as the original inventor of the telephone and ordered its lawyers to take action at once against the Bell Company for infringement of the Gray patent. 
This high-handed action, it hoped, would most quickly bring the little bell group into a humble and submissive frame of mind. Every morning the Western Union looked to see the white flag flying over the bell headquarters. But no white flag appeared. On the contrary, the news came that the bell company had secured two eminent lawyers and were ready to give battle. The case began in the autumn of 1878 and lasted for a year. Then it came to a sudden and most unexpected ending. The lawyer-in-chief of the Western Union was George Gifford, who was perhaps the ablest patent attorney of his day. He was versed in patent lore from Alpha to Omega, and as the trial proceeded, he became convinced that the Bell patent was valid. He notified the Western Union confidentially, of course, that its case could not be proven, and that Bell was the original inventor of the telephone. The best policy, he suggested, was to withdraw their claims and make a settlement. This wise advice was accepted, and the next day the white flag was hauled up, not by the little group of bell fighters, who were huddled together in a tiny two-room office, but by the mighty Western Union itself, which had been so arrogant when the encounter began. A committee of three from each side was appointed, and after months of disputation, a treaty of peace was drawn up and signed. By the terms of this treaty, the Western Union agreed, 1. To admit that Bell was the original inventor. 2. To admit that his patents were valid. 3. To retire from the telephone business. The Bell Company, in return for this surrender, agreed, 1 to buy the Western Union telephone system, 2. to pay the Western Union a royalty of 20% on all telephone rentals, 3. to keep out of the telegraph business. This agreement, which was to remain in force for 17 years, was a master stroke of diplomacy on the part of the Bell Company. It was the Magna Carta of the telephone. It transformed a giant competitor into a friend. It added to the Bell system 56,000 telephones in 55 cities. And it swung the valiant little company up to such a pinnacle of prosperity that its stock went skyrocketing until it touched $1,000 a share. The Western Union had lost its case for several very simple reasons. It had tried to operate a telephone system on telegraphic lines a plan that has invariably been unsuccessful. It had a low idea of the possibilities of the telephone business. And its already busy agents had little time or knowledge or enthusiasm to give to the new enterprise. With all its power, it found itself outfought by this compact body of picked men who were young, zealous, well-handled, and protected by a most invulnerable patent. The Bell Telephone now took its place with the telegraph, the railroad, the steamboat, the harvester, and the other necessities of a civilized country. Its pioneer days were over. There was no more ridicule and incredulity. Everyone knew that the Bell people had whipped the Western Union and hastened to join in the grand te deum of applause. Within five months from the signing of the agreement, there had to be a reorganization, and the American Bell Telephone Company was created, with $6 million capital. In the following year, 1881, 1,200 new towns and cities were marked on the telephone map, and the first dividends were paid, $178,500. And in 1882, there came such a telephone boom that the Bell system was multiplied by two, with more than a million dollars of gross earnings. At this point, all the earliest pioneers of the telephone, except Vail, pass out of its history. Thomas Sanders sold his stock for somewhat less than a million dollars, and presently lost most of it in a Colorado gold mine. His mother, who had been so good a friend to Bell, had her fortune doubled. Gardner G. Hubbard withdrew from business life, and as it was impossible for a man of his ardent temperament to be idle, he plunged into the National Geographic Society. He was a Colonel Sellers whose dream of millions for the telephone had come true, and when he died in 1897, 
He was rich both in money and in the affection of his friends. Charles Williams, in whose workshop the first telephones were made, sold his factory to the Bell Company in 1881 for more money than he had ever expected to possess. Thomas A. Watson resigned at the same time, finding himself no longer a wage worker, but a millionaire. Several years later, he established a shipbuilding plant near Boston, which grew until it employed 4,000 workmen and had built half a dozen more ships for the United States Navy. As for Bell, the first cause of the telephone business, he did what a true scientific bohemian might have been expected to do. He gave all his stock to his bride on their marriage day and resumed his work as an instructor of deaf mutes. Few kings, if any, had ever given so rich a wedding present, and certainly no one in any country ever obtained and tossed aside an immense fortune as incidentally as did Bell. When the Bell Company offered him a salary of $10,000 a year to remain its chief inventor, he refused the offer cheerfully on the ground that he could not invent to order. In 1880, the French government gave him the Volta Prize of 50,000 francs and the Cross of the Legion of Honor. He has had many honors since then and many interests. He has been for thirty years one of the most brilliant and picturesque personalities in American public life. But none of his later achievements can in any degree compare with what he did in a cellar in Salem at twenty-eight years of age. They had all become rich, these first friends of the telephone, but not fabulously so. There was not at that time, nor has there been since, anyone who became a multimillionaire by the sale of telephone service. If the Bell Company had sold its stock at the highest price reached in 1880, it would have received less than $9 million, a huge sum, but not too much to pay for the invention of the telephone and the building up of a new art and a new industry. It was not as much as the value of the eggs laid during the last 12 months by the hens of Iowa. But, as may be imagined, when the news of the Western Union Agreement became known, the story of the telephone became a fairy tale of success. Theodore Vail was given a banquet by his old-time friends in the Washington Postal Service and toasted as the Monte Cristo of the telephone. It was said that the actual cost of the Bell plant was only one-twenty-fifth of its capital and that every four cents of investment had thus become a dollar. Even Jay Gould, carried beyond his usual caution by these stories, ran up to New Haven and bought its telephone company, only to find out later that its earnings were less than its expenses. Much to the bewilderment of the Bell Company, it soon learned that the troubles of wealth are as numerous as those of poverty. It was beset by a throng of promoters and stock jobbers who fell upon it and upon the public like a swarm of seventeen-year locusts. In three years, 125 competing companies were started, in open defiance of the Bell Patents. The main object of these companies was not, like that of the Western Union, to do a legitimate telephone business, but to sell stock to the public. The face value of their stock was $225 million, although few of them ever sent a message. One company of unusual impertinence, without money or patents, had capitalized its audacity at $15 million. How to hold the business that had been established? That was now the problem. None of the Bell partners had been mere stock jobbers. At one time they had even taken a pledge not to sell any of their stock to outsiders. They had financed their company in a most honest and simple way, and they were desperately opposed to the financial banditti whose purpose was to transform the telephone business into a cheat and a gamble. At first, having held their own against the Western Union, they expected to make short work of the stock jobbers. But it was a vain hope. These bogus companies, they found, did not fight in the open, as the Western Union had done. All manner of injurious rumors were presently set afloat concerning the Bell patent. Other inventors, some of them honest men, and some shameless pretenders, 
were brought forward with strangely concocted tales of prior invention. The Granger movement was at that time a strong political factor in the Middle West, and its blind fear of patents and monopolies was turned aggressively against the Bell Company. A few senators and legitimate capitalists were lifted up as the figureheads of the crusade, and a loud hue and cry was raised in the newspapers against high rates and monopoly to distract the minds of the people from the real issue of legitimate business versus stock company bubbles. The most plausible and persistent of all the various inventors who snatched at Bell's laurels was Elisha Gray. He refused to abide by the adverse decision of the court. Several years after his defeat, he came forward with new weapons and new methods of attack. He became more hostile and irreconcilable, and until his death in 1901, never renounced his claim to be the original inventor of the telephone. The reason for this persistence is very evident. Gray was a professional inventor, a highly competent man, who had begun his career as a blacksmith's apprentice and risen to be a professor of Oberlin. He made, during his lifetime, over $5 million by his patents. In 1874, he and Bell were running a neck-and-neck -neck race to see who could first invent a musical telegraph. When, presto, Bell suddenly turned aside, because of his acoustical knowledge, and invented the telephone, while Gray kept straight ahead. Like all others who were in quest of a better telegraph instrument, Gray had glimmerings of the possibility of sending speech by wire, and by one of the strangest of coincidences, he filed a caveat on the subject on the same day that Bell filed the application for a patent. Bell had arrived first. As the record book shows, the fifth entry on that day was A. G. Bell, $15, and the thirty-ninth entry was E. Gray, $10. There was a vast difference between Gray's caveat and Bell's application. A caveat is a declaration that the writer has not invented a thing, but believes that he is about to do so, while an application is a declaration that the writer has already perfected the invention. But Gray could never forget that he had seemed to be, for a time, so close to the golden prize, and seven years after he had been set aside by the Western Union Agreement, he reappeared with claims that had grown larger and more definite. When all the evidence in the various gray lawsuits is sifted out, there appear to have been three distinctly different grays. First, Gray the scoffer, who examined Bell's telephone at the Centennial and said it was nothing but the old lover's telegraph. It is impossible to make a practical speaking telephone on the principle shown by Professor Bell. The currents are too feeble. Second, Gray the convert, who wrote frankly to Bell in 1877, I do not claim the credit of inventing it. And third, Gray the claimant, who endeavored to prove in 1886 that he was the original inventor. His real position in the matter was once well and wittily described by his partner, Enos M. Barton, who said, Of all the men who didn't invent the telephone, Gray was the nearest. It is now clearly seen that the telephone owes nothing to Gray. There are no Gray telephones in use in any country. Even Gray himself, as he admitted in court, failed when he tried to make a telephone on the lines laid down in his caveat. The final word on the whole matter was recently spoken by George C. Maynard, who established the telephone business in the city of Washington. Said Mr. Maynard, Mr. Gray was an intimate and valued friend of mine but it is no disrespect to his memory to say that on some points involved in the telephone matter he was mistaken. No subject was ever so thoroughly investigated as the invention of the speaking telephone. No patent has ever been submitted to such determined assault from every direction as Bell's, and no inventor has ever been more completely vindicated. Bell was the first inventor, and Gray was not. After Gray, the weightiest challenger who came against Bell was Professor Amos E. Dolbear of Tufts College. He, like Gray, had written a letter of applause to Bell in 1877. "'I congratulate you, sir,' he said, "'upon your very great invention. 
and I hope to see it supplant all forms of existing telegraphs, and that you will be successful in obtaining the wealth and honor which is your due. But one year later, Dolbear came to view with an opposition telephone. It was not an imitation of Bell's, he insisted, but an improvement upon an electrical device made by a German named Philip Rice in 1861. Thus there appeared upon the scene the so-called Rice Telephone, which was not a telephone at all in any practical sense, but which served well enough for nine years or more as a weapon to use against the Bell patents. Poor Philip Rice himself, the son of a baker in Frankfurt, Germany, had hoped to make a telephone, but he had failed. His machine was operated by a make-and-break current, and so could not carry the infinitely delicate vibrations made by the human voice. It could transmit the pitch of a sound, but not the quality. At its best, it could carry a tune, but never at any time a spoken sentence. Rice, in his later years, realized that his machine could never be used for the transmission of conversation, and in a letter to a friend he tells of a code of signals that he has invented. Bell had once, during his three years of experimenting, made a Rice machine, although at that time he had not seen one. But he soon threw it aside as of no practical value. As a teacher of acoustics, Bell knew that the one indispensable requirement of a telephone is that it shall transmit the whole of a sound, and not merely the pitch of it. Such scientists as Lord Kelvin, Joseph Henry, and Edison had seen the little rice instrument years before Bell invented the telephone, but they regarded it as a mere musical toy. It was not in any sense a speaking telephone, said Lord Kelvin, and Edison, when trying to put the rice machine in the most favorable light, admitted humorously that when he used a rice transmitter he generally knew what was coming, and knowing what was coming, even a rice transmitter, pure and simple, reproduces sounds which seem almost like that which was being transmitted, but when the man at the other end did not know what was coming, it was very seldom that any word was recognized. In the course of the Dolbear lawsuit, a rice machine was brought into court and created much amusement. It was able to squeak, but not to speak. Experts and professors wrestled with it in vain. It refused to transmit one intelligible sentence. It can speak, but it won't, explained one of Dolbear's lawyers. It is now generally known that while a rice machine, when clogged and out of order, would transmit a word or two in an imperfect way, it was built on wrong lines. It was no more a telephone than a wagon is a sleigh, even though it is possible to chain the wheels and make them slide for a foot or two. Said Judge Lowell, in rendering his famous decision, A century of rice would never have produced a speaking telephone by mere improvement of construction. It was left for Bell to discover that the failure was due not to workmanship, but to the principle which was adopted as the basis of what had to be done. Bell discovered a new art, that of transmitting speech by electricity, and his claim is not as broad as his invention. To follow Rice is to fail, but to follow Bell is to succeed. After the victory over Dolbear, the Bell stock went soaring skywards, and the higher it went, the greater were the number of infringers and blowers of stock bubbles. To bait the Bell Company became almost a national sport, any sort of claimant, with any sort of wild tale of prior invention, could find a speculator to support him. On they came, a motley array, some in rags, some on nags, and some in velvet gowns. One of them claimed to have done wonders with an iron hoop and a file in 1867. A second had a marvelous table with glass legs. A third swore that he had made a telephone in 1860, but did not know what it was until he saw Bell's patent. And a fourth told a vivid story of having heard a bullfrog croak via a telegraph wire which was strung into a certain cellar in Racine in 1851. This comic opera phase came to a head in the famous Drawbaw case, which lasted for nearly four years and filled 10,000 pages with its evidence. Having failed on Rice, the German, the opponents of Bell now brought forward an American inventor named Daniel Drawbaugh. 
and opened up a noisy newspaper campaign. To secure public sympathy for Drawbaugh, it was said that he had invented a complete telephone and switchboard before 1876, but was in such utter and abject poverty that he could not get himself a patent. Five hundred witnesses were examined, and such a general turmoil was aroused that the Bell lawyers were compelled to take the attack seriously, and to fight back with every pound of ammunition they possessed. The fact about Drawbaugh is that he was a mechanic in a little country village near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He was ingenious, but not inventive, and loved to display his mechanical skill before the farmers and villagers. He was a subscriber to The Scientific American, and it had become the fixed habit of his life to copy other people's inventions and exhibit them as his own. He was a trailer of inventors. More than 40 instances of this imitative habit were shown at the trial, and he was severely scored by the judge, who accused him of deliberately falsifying the facts. His ruling passion of imitation, apparently, was not diminished by the loss of his telephone claims, as he came to public view again in 1908 as a trailer of Marconi. Drawbaugh's defeat sent the bell stock up once more and brought on a Xerxes army of opposition which called itself the Overland Company. Having learned that no one claimant could beat Bell in the courts, this company massed the losers together and came forward with a scrap basket full of patents. Several powerful capitalists undertook to pay the expenses of this adventure. Wires were strung, stock was sold, and the enterprise looked for a time so genuine that when the Bell lawyers asked for an injunction against it, they were refused. This was as hard a blow as the Bell people received in their eleven years of litigation, and the Bell stock tumbled thirty-five points in a few days. Infringing companies sprang up like gourds in the night, and all went merrily with the promoters until the Overland Company was thrown out of court as having no evidence except the refuse and dregs of former cases, the heel taps found in the glasses at the end of a frolic. But even after this defeat for the claimants, the frolic was not wholly ended. They next planned to get through politics what they could not get through law. They induced the government to bring suit for the annulment of the Bell patents. It was a bold and desperate move, and enabled the promoters of paper companies to sell stock for several years longer. The whole dispute was reopened from gray to drawbaw. Every battle was refought, and in the end, of course, the government officials learned that they were being used to pull telephone chestnuts out of the fire. The case was allowed to die a natural death, and was informally dropped in 1896. In all, the Bell Company fought out 13 lawsuits that were of national interest and five that were carried to the Supreme Court in Washington. It fought out 587 other lawsuits of various natures, and with the exception of two trivial contract suits, it never lost a case. Its experience is an unanswerable indictment of our system of protecting inventors. No inventor had ever a clearer title than Bell. The Patent Office itself, in 1884, made an 18 months investigation of all telephone patents and reported, It is to Bell that the world owes the possession of the speaking telephone. Yet his patent was continuously under fire, and never at any time secure. Stock companies whose paper capital totaled more than $500 million were organized to break it down and from first to last the success of the telephone was based much less upon the monopoly of patents than upon the building up of a well-organized business. Fortunately for Bell and the men who upheld him, they were defended by two master lawyers who have seldom, if ever, had an equal for teamwork and efficiency, Chauncey Smith and James J. Storrow. These two men were marvelously well-mated. Smith was an old-fashioned attorney of the Websterian sort, dignified, ponderous, and impressive. By 1878, when he came in to defend the Little Bell Company against the towering Western Union, Smith had become the most noted patent lawyer in Boston. He was a large, thick-set man, a reminder of Benjamin Franklin, with clean-shaven face, long hair curling at the ends, frock coat, 
high collar, and beaver hat. Starro, on the contrary, was a small man, quiet in manner, conversational in argument, and an encyclopedia of definite information. He was so thorough that, when he became a bell lawyer, he first spent an entire summer at his country home in Petersham, studying the laws of physics and electricity. He was never in the slightest degree spectacular. Only once during the eleven years of litigation did he lose control of his temper. He was attacking the credibility of a witness whom he had put on the stand, but who had been tampered with by the opposition lawyers. "'But this man is your own witness,' protested the lawyers. "'Yes!' shouted the usually soft-spoken Storrow. "'He was my witness, but now he is your liar!' The efficiency of these two men was greatly increased by a third, Thomas D. Lockwood, who was chosen by Vail in 1879 to establish a patent department. Two years before, Lockwood had heard Bell lecture in Chickering Hall, New York, and was a doubting Thomas. But a closer study of the telephone transformed him into an enthusiast. Having a memory like a filing system and a knack for invention, Lockwood was well fitted to create such a department. He was a man born for the place, and he has seen the number of electrical patents grow from a few hundred in 1878 to 80,000 in 1910. These three men were the defenders of the Bell patents. As Vail built up the young telephone business, they held it from being torn to shreds in an orgy of speculative competition. Smith prepared the comprehensive plan of defense. By his sagacity and experience, he was enabled to mark out the general principles upon which Bell had a right to stand. Usually he closed the case, and he was immensely effective, as he would declaim in his deep voice, I submit, Your Honor, that the literature of the world does not afford a passage which states how the human voice can be electrically transmitted previous to the patent of Mr. Bell. His death, like his life, was dramatic. He was on his feet in the courtroom, battling against an infringer, when in the middle of a sentence he fell to the floor, overcome by sickness and the responsibilities he had carried for twelve years. Storrow, in a different way, was fully as indispensable as Smith. It was he who built up the superstructure of the Bell defense. He was a master of details. His brain was keen and incisive and some of his briefs will be studied as long as the art of the telephone exists. He might fairly have been compared, in action, to a rapid-firing Gatling gun, while Smith was a hundred-ton cannon, and Lockwood was the maker of the ammunition. Smith and Starro had three main arguments that never were and never could be answered. Fifty or more of the most eminent lawyers of that day tried to demolish these arguments and failed. The first was Bell's clear, straightforward story of how he did it, which rebuked and confounded the mob of pretenders. The second was the historical fact that the most eminent electrical scientists of Europe and America had seen Bell's telephone at the Centennial and had declared it to be new. Not only new, but marvelous, said Tyndall. And the third was the very significant fact that no one challenged Bell's claim to be the original inventor of the telephone until his patent was 17 months old. The patent itself, too, was a remarkable document. It was a Gibraltar of security to the Bell Company. For eleven years it was attacked from all sides, and never dented. It covered an entire art, yet it was sustained during its whole lifetime. Printed in full, it would make ten pages of this book, but the core of it is in the last sentence. The method of an apparatus for transmitting vocal or other sounds telegraphically by causing electrical undulations similar in form to the vibrations of the air accompanying the said vocal or other sounds. These words expressed an idea that had never been written before. It could not be evaded or overcome. There were only thirty-two words, but in six years these words represented an investment of a million dollars apiece. Now that the clamor of this great patent war has died away, it is evident that Bell received no more credit and no more reward than he deserved. There was no telephone until he made one. 
and since he made one, no one has found out any other way. Hundreds of clever men have been trying for more than thirty years to outrival Bell, and yet every telephone in the world is still made on the plan that Bell discovered. No inventor who preceded Bell did more in the invention of the telephone than to help Bell indirectly, in the same way that Fra Mauro and Toscanelli helped in the discovery of America by making the map and chart that were used by Columbus. Bell was helped by his father, who taught him the laws of acoustics, by Helmholtz, who taught him the influence of magnets upon sound vibrations, by Koenig and Leon Scott, who taught him the infinite variety of these vibrations, by Dr. Clarence J. Blake, who gave him a human ear for his experiments, and by Joseph Henry and Sir Charles Wheatstone, who encouraged him to persevere. In a still more indirect way, he was helped by Morse's invention of the telegraph, by Faraday's discovery of the phenomena of magnetic induction, by Sturgeon's first electromagnet, and by Volta's electric battery. All that scientists had achieved, from Galileo and Newton to Franklin and Simon Newcomb, helped Bell in a general way by creating a scientific atmosphere and habit of thought. But in the actual making of the telephone, there was no one with Bell or before him. He invented it first and alone. End of chapter 3 of The History of the Telephone by Herbert Casson.